According to the Commonwealth Fund Healthcare Research, Canadian healthcare is the least affordable and the least accessible among the developed countries. At the same time, it ranks among the top spenders on the Medicare. What is it that they spend all this money on then? On the flip side, Canadian life expectancy has been climbing steadily over the years, and Canada is in the list of top 20 countries with the biggest life expectancy, and in the list of top 20 healthiest countries in the world. It means that Canadian healthcare is doing something right. Let's investigate. In this video, we will explain how the Canadian healthcare system works, where the healthcare dollars are spent, what services are covered under the Canadian universal healthcare, and what you should do if you need to see a doctor. And additionally, we will talk about the main points of criticism of the Canadian healthcare and try to look into the future and see what we have to expect as Canadian residents. This will be a comprehensive video, so please feel free to skip to the chapter that you're most interested in. And while you do that, don't forget to click the like button below as a token of appreciation. Let's go! Canada is known for the free healthcare. In reality, Canadian healthcare is financed through federal budget and residence tax. Almost 70% of Canadian healthcare is publicly financed, while the other 30 is privately funded. Also, while Canadians are generally financing the healthcare through taxes, higher earners are taxed more. What it means is that a higher earner in their 30s is contributing more to the healthcare than a fresh graduate from university who works at Tim Hortons, for example. The purpose of the Canadian National Health Insurance System is to ensure that all Canadians have access to the same quality of healthcare on the basis of need rather than the ability to pay. This way, everyone should always receive care as long as you hold a legal status in Canada, which is either a Canadian citizen, permanent resident, indigenous people, refugees, and Canadian work permit holders. But wait! If you have all that, you don't automatically get covered by a Canadian healthcare system because there are 13 different medical systems that operate relatively independently. There is a separate system for each province and territory. In order to be covered under universal healthcare, you have to meet certain residency requirements in that specific province or territory. Most provinces require three months of residency before your health coverage becomes active. So if you've just moved to Canada or simply moved to a new province, you will have to wait until you can qualify for your coverage. It's not uncommon to purchase private insurance for those three months while you wait for your provincial health coverage to kick in, which would cost around $500 per person. Most provinces also have a minimum annual residency requirement to keep your health coverage active. So if you stay out of certain provinces for longer than three or six months, you become ineligible for the coverage. All these restrictions are set in place to protect the system from misuse. Even though we have the means to prevent or delay many health problems, the Canadian healthcare system is primarily focused on diagnosis, treatment, and care. Prevention isn't something that doctors focus on in Canada. Although there is some evidence that the ties are changing and the government is starting to invest into it more. We actually saw some evidence of that during the COVID pandemic. After all, it's a lot cheaper to prevent a disease from happening by encouraging a population to stay active, stay educated, and eat healthy, rather than spending money on treatment treatment and hospital care. This concept largely drives how the universal healthcare will be evolving in the future, but it's not the case today. The responsibilities of the universal Canadian healthcare are divided between the federal and provincial governments. The federal government's job is essentially to reinforce the Canadian healthcare standards, distribute financing to regulate the public health, and to make sure that healthcare providers don't overcharge patients for services it already pays them for. The provincial government is responsible for understanding the needs of its population and deciding how the money they receive from the federal government will be spent. It's up to each province to determine which services are medically necessary. If it is determined that a service is medically necessary, the full cost of the service must be covered by the public health insurance plan. That's how you end up with 13 unique healthcare systems, and your coverage will depend on the province you live in. For instance, only four provinces cover all or portion of medically assisted reproduction services. Ontario and Quebec cover it as part of healthcare coverage, while New Brunswick and Manitoba provide a tax credit. 
Manitoba is the only province to provide chiropractic care. It's free for up to seven visits per year. Ambulance fees are fully covered in Nova Scotia and partially covered in Ontario, while in Quebec and British Columbia you pay out of pocket or must use private insurance if you want to get a ride on an ambulance to the hospital. The real downside of 13 different healthcare systems is that coordinating health reforms across the whole country becomes a significant challenge. You cannot do that just at a flip of a switch. You need to influence and coordinate between all 10 provinces and three territories. If you want to understand how provincial health insurance works, we will leave a link to the directory below. In essence, everything is available on the provincial website. But what happens if you're in another province and need to get medical treatment? Normally, you will not have to pay for services like hospital care or physician care if you're in another province, as long as you have a valid healthcare card, unless you are in Quebec. If you seek medical help in Quebec, you might be asked to pay for your services and then seek reimbursements later. Please note that any service received out of province must be deemed medically necessary for it to be covered by your insurance. Back before the 1950s, Canadians personally paid their medical bills or turned to charity organizations like the Red Cross when they couldn't afford it. Everything's changed during the World War II times when too many people fell sick and couldn't afford treatment, and that impacted productivity everywhere in the country. Saskatchewan became the first province to introduce public insurance plan covering hospital services in Canada in 1947. By the 1950s, both British Columbia and Alberta joined in. And by 1960s, all the provinces and territories had agreed to provide publicly funded hospital and diagnostic services. This transition wasn't smooth, though. Doctors of some provinces were enraged. Some even went on a three-week-long strike. They used to be able to charge as much as they wanted for their services, but not anymore. By the 1970s, the national insurance was extended to cover medical services outside hospitals. And the next huge step in Canada was the Health Act in 1984. It established the common criteria and principles for health insurance plans for all provinces and territories. This is how every province is kept accountable for delivering health care to Canadians. Before we dive deeper into what Canadian healthcare covers, let's look under the hood and try to understand how the Canadian government is spending money on healthcare. Healthcare spending is vast. It's tripled in the last 20 years and it represents between 12 to 14% of Canada's GDP. And the curious thing is that the amount of healthcare dollars spent on various things has changed significantly over the last three decades. The top three highest expenditure categories in Canada are hospitals, physicians and drugs. On average, the share of total health expenditures paid to hospitals has declined by nearly 20%. Expenditure on physicians is pretty much at the same level as it was in the 1970s, despite the fact that the population in Canada has grown by 65%. These numbers are getting me worried. Spending on drugs, though, has greatly increased, almost doubled. This is where it's getting interesting. Canada is among the highest spenders on the overall healthcare in the OECD, but we spend less than most other countries on hospital services. Why is that? And is that a good thing? Well, one reason is that the Canadian healthcare has been moving away from the in-hospital care to the home care and home care is not covered under the Universal Canadian Health Care Act. How convenient! Why keep hospitals overcrowded when you can prescribe some drugs, send the patient home, and have their family look after them? Aside from that, Canada's rising life expectancy is good news for us humans, but bad news for healthcare system. The aging population is putting an additional strain on the already strained medical system in Canada. This graph shows how progressive the healthcare spending is for each age group. 
So the focus has shifted away from funding hospitals towards budgets for long-term care programs in provinces. And they're not part of universal health care, but rather other provincial social benefits. Another interesting development is other health expenditure that's risen over the years. This is a good indication that there is a gradual shift towards disease prevention and health promotion through new initiatives. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Overall, universal Canadian healthcare system is optimized for the very young and the very old. And it's obvious that the spending is disproportionately focused on the aging population. Looking at drug spending in 2020, these are the top three drug classes. When we look at hospital expenditure, it costs a lot to maintain and manage a hospital. Most of hospital costs are salaries of nurses and support workers. That is why when budgets get cut, nurses and first-line hospital workers get hurt the most. This doesn't include doctors who are self-employed and bill the government for the service, not the hospital. Canada's per capita hospital spending in 2020 was $1,694. And it is the lowest among most developed countries. And this is the clue to why the situation became so terrible when the COVID pandemic happened. For instance, the average estimated cost of a COVID hospital stay in Canada was around $23,000. That's about four times more expensive than a hospital stay for influenza and three times the average cost of a stay for a heart attack and almost as much as the cost for a stay for a kidney transplant. Now that puts things into perspective when we try to understand why Canadian government has been so strict about pandemic restrictions and lockdowns. Every COVID hospital case costs the same as 17 average hospital stays, not to mention increased demand for supplies and equipment, which were in shortage everywhere in the world. The government was simply getting squeezed by skyrocketing costs. Now that's some food for thought for you here. I know it's a lot to digest, but next up, let's talk about what's covered under universal Canadian healthcare for an average Canadian. We'll talk about primary and secondary healthcare services, additional services, and private insurance. When Canadians need health care, the primary health care services are the first point of contact. It can be your family doctor, the emergency room, or the walk-in clinic. A specialist that you get referred to, like a cardiologist or a gynecologist, and any lab tests you do, are also part of the primary care. The primary services are also responsible for keeping your health records in order and sharing them with all the specialists that they refer you to. All of these services are fully covered under the Canadian Universal Healthcare. In 2021, there were 2.7 practicing physicians per 1,000 population. About half were family physicians or general practitioners, and the rest specialists. GPs act largely as gatekeepers because the number of specialists, as you can see, is extremely low in Canada. Primary healthcare services are increasingly comprehensive, and here's what they predominantly cover. Basic emergency services, referrals to specialists and coordination of hospitals, primary mental health care, palliative and end-of-life care, health promotion, healthy child development, primary maternity care, and rehabilitation services. Let's say you need to see a doctor. In order to see one, you can go to a walk-in clinic, schedule an appointment with your family doctor, or if it's an emergency, go directly to the nearest hospital's emergency room. In theory, patients have free choice of which GP or clinic to go to. In practice, however, Patients may not be accepted into a physician's practice if the physician has a closed list. The difficulty finding a family doctor may vary from province to province. When I lived in Quebec, for instance, I registered for a waitlist to get a family doctor and I never got a call back for six years before I moved to Ontario. When I moved to Toronto, it took me only three calls in about 30 minutes to get a family doctor. Just five years ago, in 2017, 92% of physicians practiced in urban locations. There are no national programs to ensure a supply of doctors in rural and remote locations. This, in my opinion, Opinion is a big issue because that drives more people away from rural areas and overpopulates urban areas. Surprise, surprise, we wonder why big cities like Toronto and Vancouver are so unaffordable. Who will want to live in a rural Canada with little to no access to Medicare?
In Canada, on paper, patients can choose to go directly to specialists if they'd like to. But in reality, it's a lot more common for your general practitioner to refer you to a specialist. And some specialists won't even take an appointment with you unless you've been referred to them. This is largely driven by the deficit of specialist doctors in Canada. You cannot be charged a user fee when a physician provides a service covered by Canadian healthcare. So be skeptical if your standard doctor visit gives you a bill to pay. In some provinces, there may be a fee for missed appointments appointments or doctor's notes or for prescription refills done over the phone. That's because doctors receive no payment from the province on these items, so they put this cost on you, the patient. Here are some types of specialty care which are not covered by universal health care. These services include things like prescription drugs that are provided outside of the hospital settings, dental services provided in a dentist's office, most optometry services and cosmetic surgery, and many more. By the way, most doctors in Canada work in independent or group practices. They are self-employed and bill the government for their services. According to the official data reported, the average gross payment per physician in 2020 was just over $350,000. Family doctors earned a little bit less than that and medical specialists earned a little bit more than that on average. And surgical specialists make the biggest buck. I guess it answers your question of which specialty to choose if you want to be a doctor. These rates are negotiated between each provincial and territorial government and the medical professionals, so salaries for doctors will be different in different provinces. When a patient is referred for a specialized care or needs treatment for a more complex medical issue where hospitalization might be necessary, this is where the secondary medical care kicks in. Hospitals are a mix of public and private, predominantly publicly owned and not-for-profit. Hospitals are generally funded through annual budgets with expenditure targets, and in-hospital care is covered under Canadian Universal Health Care. This includes nurses and doctors, examinations to diagnose, surgeries, medications for patients, as well as accommodation and meals. Abortion services are also included in universal Canadian healthcare. One thing that surprised me in Canada is how seriously mental health is taken here. Mental illness impacts approximately one in every five Canadians. While physician-provided mental health care is not formally integrated into primary care yet, some of it is covered under Canadian Medicare, and some provinces, like Ontario for instance, has made some significant progress on making it part of primary care. The provinces and territories provide additional coverage to certain groups of people for healthcare services that are not generally covered by publicly funded medical systems. The groups that qualify for such coverage are usually seniors, children, and low-income residents. These supplementary health benefits often include prescription drugs outside hospitals, dental care, vision care, medical equipment, and other health professionals such as physiotherapists. Long-term care and end-of-life care provided in non-hospital facilities facilities and in the community are not considered insured services under the Canada Health Act. Eligibility for home and residential long-term care services is generally determined via needs assessment individually. You can find all the information about whether or not you can qualify for additional services on the provincial government website. It's no secret that private health insurance is something that Canadians rely on in addition to public health insurance. Private health insurance helps you pay for things that public health insurance doesn't cover. Extended private insurance health plans cover costs for prescription medications, dental care, physiotherapy, ambulance services, and prescription eyeglasses. Such insurance is typically provided by your employer and is part of the general benefits and compensation package. And it's very common for the employer to cover 80 to 100% of the insurance costs for you and your immediate family. If you don't have a job or are self-employed or your employer doesn't offer insurance, by the way, run from that employer. This insurance can be purchased individually from one of numerous insurance companies in Canada. A typical monthly cost for such insurance can be anywhere between $150 to $200 monthly. So what does all of that mean for us as we're getting older here in Canada? The healthcare system is subject to a lot of criticism, and here's the four main challenges that I'd like to point out. 
Decrease in physician and hospital spending puts less resources in the hospitals, all while immigration and population grow. This, in turn, increases wait times, puts more pressure on doctors, and if something unexpected like a global pandemic happens, makes it completely incapable of reacting to it adequately. When it comes to hospital care, more procedures are being done on an outpatient basis. The number of day surgeries have risen with the goal to keep patients in the hospitals for as little as possible to free up beds for the next patient. This creates risks, since post-surgical complications may happen and patients aren't necessarily well equipped to adequately react to them. Organizationally speaking, letting doctors run as self-employed contractors also creates a lot of variability in the level and quality of healthcare delivered. Each of them ends up operating as a separate unit who sets their own standards of service. Anything from the clinic's opening times to managing patients' files and even quality of treatment and patient interactions. Physicians have zero incentive to get better at their craft, collaborate with other doctors, and expand their network to provide more diverse referrals and recommend optimal treatments. To date, there is no official information publicly available on doctors' performance across the country. One of the few things that patients can use to check doctors' reputation is a website called RateMDs. How can a patient like us, a regular folk, can objectively assess the doctor's skills and knowledge during the treatment? Oftentimes, we can only learn that the doctor's advice was bad much later, when it's potentially too late. Accessibility is a big issue as well. 92% of doctors are currently practicing in urban areas. Rural areas are highly underserved. And as Canada is bringing more and more immigrants to the country, the population is rising and most immigrants are driven to the urban areas because they're simply better serviced by healthcare and other services. This will eventually lead to overpopulation and increased costs of living and real estate and even more. And all that while rural areas remain weakly populated with little to no reason to invest into developing its infrastructure. To to sum up, we need to reduce unnecessary hospital visits, decrease bureaucracy, fix wait times, increase efficiency, and increase access to healthcare. This requires more support for direct patient care, such as physicians, nurses, and reduction of bureaucracy and administrative costs. In addition to training more nurses and physicians, we need to allow highly qualified, foreign-trained physicians to have an easier path to active practice. So is there a brighter future? We think there certainly is. Based on our research, there are two categories that stand out for the future Canadian healthcare development. First is disease prevention and promotion of health, including community mental health and addictions. And second, it's occupational health to promote and enhance health and safety at the workplace. Here are other things that Canadian healthcare system is paying more attention to. A great example of public health care in action was during the pandemic. Their job was straightforward – to prevent the spread of the pandemic and implement measures and education tactics to reduce the strain on the medical system. Remember, preventing the disease from happening is a lot cheaper than treating it at scale if only people listened, right? What all of this means is that Canadian healthcare is being intentional. It recognizes that the aging population will only become more and more financially demanding. And it already is. So it slowly focuses on spending more dollars on prevention. This way you can focus on improving quality of life of population as early as possible in order to prevent medical conditions from happening. And if it's not possible to prevent diseases, then you delay them as much as possible so they happen at later stage in life. And it's good for everyone. It's good for the population because we get to live longer, healthier and happier lives. And it's good for the government because it's able to manage budgets accordingly and keep tax levels at a certain range. This video was prioritized for publishing thanks to our first patron who voted for this topic. Thank you. If you want to be able to vote for future topics to be uncovered on our channel, please follow us on Patreon. What do you think is the biggest strain in Canadian medical system? What ways can help Help us improve the quality of healthcare in Canada. What can we learn from other countries based on your experience? Leave your thoughts and comments below. If you stay till this moment of this video, now is the best time to tap the like button below and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. 
We will see you in the next video. And until then, please take care after yourself and stay safe. Bye.